I had no intention of watching the new Halloween. My interest in the series doesn't really go beyond the first three, and I haven't seen the first two of the latest rebooted trilogy. Most all of the YouTube movie reviewers I watch have been predictably poo-pooing the endings, with the one strange exception being Red Letter Media. Jay and Mike both recommended it a half in the bag, and so I watched it strictly out of curiosity to try and understand what it was they were seeing. Because oftentimes with major genre films of the last 10 to 15 years, it's difficult to know where the line of quality actually is drawn anymore. The bar seems to be set at a cynically low place of, well, it wasn't actively offensive, so it's fine, I guess. At best, you have some people trying to look at the half-full glass and applaud the effort of at least attempting something that deviates from assembly line formula. Or, what's perhaps worse, is anything that rises to basic competence now being cause for celebration. This isn't a response to anything Mike or Jay said. Their interest in it was really more just a catalyst to get me to spend two hours watching this thing. And after having seen it, I can see what they were seeing, but I still think they were only seeing half the movie. I hardly ever review movies anymore, but there's something about the structure and overall tone and quality of ends that I found odd and fascinating enough to want to put my thoughts down. Halloween Ends feels like watching two movies at the same time, not parts of two different movies weaving in and out of each other, or just broad quality gaps from one section of the movie to another, or one half versus another half, but somehow coexisting from scene to scene. I've seen Frankenstein's monster-type movies, hack jobs, piece together pieces of crap that were assembled in the editing room just to try to get to feature length, or literal piece together movies like Merlin's Shop of Mystical Wonders. What I mean is the sensation of watching campy schlock nestled perfectly up against a film that you can tell those involved actually gave a shit about the end product. This movie is structurally really well done. Structurally. It almost tricks your brain into thinking that you're witnessing something with class and depth. Their recurring motifs, it's generally well shot and edited, is deliberately paced, has paced, has some compelling themes, and some veneer of style in its set design and in its kills. It's an okay movie, one bordering on memorable, but that forgot to bake its characters. The dialogue is generally awful, people don't act like real people, or even the semblance of normalcy outside of Laurie and Will Patton's character's love interest. And actions seemingly have no consequences. The town of Haddonfield does not feel like a real place. It feels like a mostly empty, surreal sandbox purgatory where freaky weirdos just go around in a state of suppressed hysteria all the time. This could perhaps be okay in the hands of a director with surrealist sensibilities, but in the end it all reads as manic schlockiness. The clueless bimbo, the cruel jocks, or in this case, cruel marching band kids? The uncaring, philandering boss, the creepy loner, the creepy ex, the wacky radio DJ, the accusatory neighbors. The pitchfork-wielding mob also still lives here from the last film. They're just a little more subdued. Everyone in this movie is either a caricature or simply have no defined motivation or reasoning behind their actions. Haddonfield is a consequence-free zone where cruel and stupid people do things and where Laurie does some aimless, surface-level introspection about the nature of evil before defeating its current incarnation again. Ruining her granddaughter's life in the process, and then being proven justified in doing so. Laurie has no arc. She is simply proven right. Evil's, evil, is, ugh, evil is a disease. She points this out to others, despite their protestations that she's a bad person who prodded the hornet's nest. Evil evolves, she kills it, got it. Corey, her foil in the film, is too sympathetic for his eventual murder spree to be scary, but too creepy to care that he starts killing in the first place. Laurie's granddaughter is the football that those two characters compete over. She becomes instantly starstruck by a very obvious weirdo with the only viable connection between the two being her feeling like she's also an outcast in the town, which we really don't see other than the fact that her ex-boyfriend is a creep and her boss and coworkers are creeps. That's not really being an outcast. That's just being surrounded by creeps. And she seeks refuge in another creep. 
If the screenwriters wanted to paint her as a sympathetic but not very intelligent person who can't escape her surroundings and social conditioning, that would be one thing. But she's presented as a normal, adjusted, attractive person who latches on to the first boy she sees because reasons. Section 2. Are there no police in this town? In the original first two Halloweens, there was a constant and ongoing police and state presence in a town where multiple murders were occurring within a few hours of each other by a maniac on the loose. In Halloween Ends, Michael and Corey seemingly have free range in the town. We're in the cell phone slash social media age, and no one in this movie seems to notice that anyone else has gone missing, or discover any corpses, or ever call law enforcement. It's weird. The police show up at the end of the movie, but outside of that, the only social concern, outside of a few smatterings of TV news reports, seems to revolve around the local radio station. Other than being a kind of retro stylistic choice, I'm not sure what deeper function it was meant to serve. In the film The Vast of Night, the radio station serves as a central communication hub around which the characters come and go and cross paths at various points in the film. It's a framing device that serves as a direct connection between the characters and the isolation and eeriness that occurs when people can't be reached. It's human beings sending signals out to each other while trying to reconcile those signals coming in from the beyond. In Halloween Ends, the radio station only serves as a unique place for one of the murders and as an exposition dump, get out of jail free card. And it's not even good exposition dump either. The DJ just rehashes what we already know in a slightly more entertaining way than just having a talking head on the news dryly exposit it. What does all of this balance out to? The movie is still directly tethered to the cheese of Halloween Kills, while trying to expound on the classier tone of Halloween 2018. It's a really nice looking French camembert cheese filled with easy squeeze. I think a lot of film reviewers are starting to better understand how to incorporate the more nebulous entertainment value of movies into their assessments. In the past, movie criticism revolved almost exclusively around either, either the reviewer's whims and mood that day or around the signifiers and general rules of film academia. This is what usually constitutes good film, or this is what you can generally look, generally look for in movies that are often agreed upon as quality. That's fine, but it doesn't always account for how oftentimes you watch something technically proficient like this but feel nothing, and can watch a movie that's technical garbage but have a blast with it. How do you account for the Batman Forevers and the Gremlin 2s of the world, or the fact that some B-movies are genuinely entertaining outside of their group ridicule value? I don't know the answer, and I'm not going to try to figure it out here, but there is a kind of wild card element that's difficult to quantify when it comes to just fun stuff happening on a screen. It may not mean anything, it may be seemingly random nonsense, but there might be a pattern to fun in movies. But this movie isn't fun. It's in the meh movie purgatory where the vast majority of studio releases fall now. All things to all people, attempting to reach the broadest market, and rarely ever striking a chord with people who might have loved it if it had bothered to take any, re any risks in either direction. To finish up, this is the one movie in movie history, at least that I've watched, that would have benefited from in It Was All a Dream Ending, with Laurie waking up from a nap in a psych ward, because it just feels like a snoozy afternoon fever dream that you'll forget when dinner rolls around. Thanks for listening, and if you like more... Blah, blah, if you like more... Thanks for listening, and if you like even more ramblings, unscripted ramblings... I have my Talking Over Albums music show. And I also did a two-hour Star Wars discussion called Plastic and Dust, What Makes Star Wars Star Wars, where I talk for two hours about what I think made the originals work in the first place. It's really good and has a lot of insights. Bye!